uh, program. I think we're going to start directly with uh, uh, Dr. Emil Basha, uh, who is the Chief Division of Cardiac and Thoracic and Vascular Surgery, Director of Congenital Pediatric Cardiac Surgery in New York Presbyterian Hospital, New York, and in the Kids Heart Medical Center, Dubai. Uh, the talk will be History and Progress in Pediatric Cardiology. The floor is yours, Dr. Emil. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you very much for the introduction. Good morning, everybody. I'd like to thank uh, the organizers, uh, Kids Heart. Well, uh, uh, you know, Dr. Sleiman uh, presented the history a little bit earlier on, and I, I just want to say that it was an obvious choice to collaborate with such a great team. It was obvious from the beginning that they had the energy and the vision and the fortitude to really create something special in pediatric cardiology in the region, and, and I think uh, it was the right choice. So <clears throat> I am going to, I'm a surgeon, so I'm not quite uh, talking about pediatric cardiology, but as uh, most of you know, uh, the field of pediatric cardiology and pediatric cardiac surgery are closely intertwined. I mean, uh, more than any other field, uh, we actually work together. Uh, we cannot, it's, uh, you know, I know the, uh, our pediatric cardiologists, sometimes I see them more than I see my own family often, actually, too often. But uh, it is, the field is such that we are really working together much more than in other areas. I don't have any disclosures. No. So now, uh, Dr. Uh, Jordan Orange uh, mentioned the Morgan Stanley Children's Hospital at Columbia University in New York. Uh, this is the uh, building, the three buildings that uh, comprise, I don't know if this, is, this works, doesn't work, but you can see the three buildings here. Those are, that's the children's hospital that we work in. The ORs are in the middle building, and the ICU are, is in the building on the left. And you can see the Hudson River back in the, and New Jersey is all the way there in the back, just to have an idea. And this is a larger view of the New York Presbyterian Columbia, um, Columbia Center uh, that we work in. And you can see the three buildings in the front. Those are the children's hospitals building. The rest is an adult and research uh, facility. It's a huge facility. The George Washington Bridge over the Hudson River in the back, for those who kind of know New York, it's, it is uh, a major, major uh, center. So uh, I'm going to focus a little bit on disruptive steps in pediatric cardiac surgery and a little bit of the history of pediatric cardiac surgery. And as I mentioned, they are very, very relevant for pediatric cardiology. So in 1938, the field was really launched by uh, Dr. Gross uh, ligation of PDA, or the first PDA in the world. And this was done at uh, Boston Children's Hospital. You can see Dr. Gross here uh, to the uh, left of Dr. Castaneda, who replaced him. Uh, both are names for, who are, uh, you know, people very well known in the field uh, that work in that field. But um, following this, 1944, the Blalock toxic shunt, uh, anybody who hasn't seen the uh, documentary on HBO about the history of the Blalock Tosic Thomas shunt, uh, Thomas was the uh, OR, the uh, research technician of uh, Dr. Blalock and really uh, is the one supposedly who was actually the brain and the hands behind that, that technique, but really who came up with it. Although actually one would say the first person who came up with it is Dr. Tosic, Helen Tosic, and shows you who's a, who was a pediatric cardiologist at a time where the specialty didn't really exist. She's the one who actually came up with the idea. Uh, Thomas is the one who effected it, and maybe uh, the glory went to Blaylock. Um, but anyways, this is how the world uh, works. But then uh, you have the first valve implant by Hufnagel, 1952, and then most importantly, in 1952 also, uh, Gibbon, who uh, develops a cardioporin bypass machine, which as you know, we could not do without uh, these days. Following this, the first AST uh, open heart repair by Dr. Lewis. That was kind of a tragic um, or semi-tragic uh, story because um, he, he perfected a heart-lung machine in those days. He did the first case. It was a stunning success. And the girl that he operated on lived to be you know, 80 years old. But the, the five next patients all died. And he actually gave up. Uh, you know, this work and really never worked in the field again, uh, but really started, and in retrospect, it's, it's, it shouldn't have happened, but this was a misunderstanding of a lot of things, in particular management of air embolism on cardiopulmonary bypass. Uh, Lily High, uh, of, you know, famous uh, pediatric heart surgeon, 
did the first tetralogy of fallot repair using cross circulation in 1954. And you can see here, um, cardiac pulmonary bypass at the time, the machines were huge. They were like taking up an entire room. And there were a lot of problems with, again, air embolism and clotting and bleeding and so forth. It didn't really know how to manage heparin. And so he used the parents of the child, the parent, one parent of the child, as a cardioporium bypass machine, was hooking up the femoral artery, femoral vein of the parent to the child. And actually, that actually worked. Now, of course, the problem is you can have a complication occurring to the parent um, as well as to the child, and that, that is why this was uh, given up eventually. But it was a very, very uh, interesting way to think about things, and he was able to successfully repair a number of congenital heart defects like that. Um, you know, Kirkland, uh, who wrote the famous textbook, and, and uh, again, uh, really worked on the systemic uh, development of congenital heart surgery. The first dose of cardioplegia is something that's not um, mentioned frequently, but you know, heart surgeons cannot do their work without a still heart. You don't really work on a beating heart, but you have to stop the heart to actually do the work, and, and to do that, you need cardioplegia. And the research on cardioplegia was early on, uh, you know, and 57 was the first time that was used. 1960, the first aortic valve uh, done. Then the first heart transplant, 1967. Uh, the story is well known, Christian Barnard in South Africa who went and watched uh, Shumway at Stanford and then came back and actually beat him to do the first transplant. It was kind of an unfair situation in the sense that uh, Shumway had worked and, and, and devoted his entire life to working on heart transplantation and was beaten by, uh, by Bernard, who, who then uh, had the worldwide uh, glory, was on the face of all the magazines and so forth, and then had a tragic ending also because he developed rheumatoid arthritis to his hands and could not operate at an early age in the 1950s. In, in, in his age of being in his 50s, he actually had to stop operating, which, uh, which again, he was a very gifted surgeon and kind of faded away. Uh, moving on, cyclosporin, huge. You can see here on the graph uh, what happened when cyclosporin developed, you know, the number of, of tri heart transplants. Before that, it was very, very difficult to manage, uh, you know, immunosuppression, and the e it was either too much or too little, and the rejection rate was very, very high, and so the patients would not really live very long. But after cyclosporin was developed, and it was a serendipitous de uh, development of cyclosporin, um, the number of, of heart transplants developed. And this is actually what gives me hope uh, about xenotransplantation. You may have heard about um, transplantation from an animal to a human. The first one occurred a few months ago at the University of Maryland in the United States. And uh, although a lot of people think that this is going to be fraught with difficulties, well, this is not the first time we're facing difficulties in medicine. And look what happened when they developed cyclosporin. Look what, what, the, what the effect is. And nowadays, we take it for granted. We do heart transplantations as if it's really not much of a, of a thing. Uh, I do believe and I predict that xenotransplantation will be um, absolutely part of our future. And this is particularly important for a country like the UAE or the Middle East, where uh, donation rates are culturally uh, uh, low, let's say. It's difficult to get donors. And if you're not relying on human donations anymore, and you can have um, you know, animals that are uh, genetically modified and used for organ transplantation, that would solve the whole donation problem and really open uh, an era of, of significant transplantation uh, feasibility for the, for the entire region. Um, then moving on, uh, 1972 DHCA's deep, deep hypothermic circulatory arrest. And this is uh, what that is, is when you actually have a child on the heart-lung machine, you cool the body temperature to 18 degrees centigrade, and then you stop all blood flow in the patient's body. Why do you do that? You do that so you can see. It's actually, you know, heart surgery is actually very simple. You actually have to see to be able to do what you're doing. And the blood is in the way, and DHCA allows you to basically drain the blood away from the child. Now, the child at that point is clinically dead, and therefore you only have a certain amount of time to do this, but it's a technique that has been proven again and again to be extremely uh, helpful and remains in use uh, today. But that was developed by Barrett Boys in New Zealand. Uh, the arterial switch uh, by uh, Jatin and, and Magdi Aoub, and then uh, going on Ebert with the uh, truncus arteriosus, and then arterial switch and neonates by Castaneda. So 
Furthermore, prostaglandin 1 in 1979, where would we be in pediatric cardiology and cardiac surgery without prostaglandins? I, I can't even imagine these guys, the, the surgeons, going in the middle of the night to, to do shunts because the ductus is closing and, and this, it was really a different time. And then the Norwood operation 1981 uh, that uh, most of you know. And then after, you know, I, my, my own opinion is after 1981, after Norwood was developed out of nothing really, uh, it, there weren't a lot of disruptive steps. Uh, from that, from the early 1980s to now, it's more of a refinement. So you have homographs uh, used as RV2PA conduit. You have ductal stenting, bilateral PA bands uh, in England by Gibbs. You have pediatric heart valve repairs, the NIDO, first ABO incompatible heart transplant that has now become routine, by the way. Anybody that, any child that we list that's less than a year old is automatically included in a ABO incompatible program. And then the, the database, emergence of the importance of database and public reporting, uh, all of these things are obviously very, very important. So uh, moving on to neonatal cardiac surgery, uh, 4,700 neonatal cardiac surgeries per year in the U.S. with an average hospital mortality of 7%, which is uh, not negligible as you think about it. Uh, most common diagnoses listed here. Most common operation in neonates um, remains the arterial switch operation followed by the Norwood stage one. Now that's for US numbers. In other countries it would be different as the Norwood is not commonly done. These are the things that we often deal with. This is a baby who's supported by a Berlin heart uh, ventricular assist device. You can see the two pumps that are sticking out of the baby's chest. Those are, this is one RVAD, right ventricular assist device. The other one is a left ventricular assist device. And uh, this is uh, certainly one of the big new advances that we're dealing with, where we're moving down lower and lower in age, supporting babies with uh, ventricular assist devices and allowing them to survive to a transplant. Uh, you know, you can think of it as a glass half full, a glass half empty, it depends on where you sit, but I think if you're the parent of a child who's benefiting from these technologies, it's definitely a glass half full. And uh, the next disruptive step well, it, it's going to come either out of data and outcome sciences or social sciences, system study, and translation of science and basic science. Uh, there is a lot of efforts uh, being exerted in the uh, machine learning and AI in pediatric cardiology, pediatric cardiac surgery. Right now, a lot of it is focused on the ICUs, but I predict that AI is going to be coming into the ORs and into everyday environment. It probably actually already has. Uh, in terms of social science and systems, uh, you know, when you talk about pediatric cardiac surgery, it's always a high-risk uh, endeavor, as you, as you can imagine. You can see that's been, that's been actually calculated uh, where, where you stand with pediatric cardiac surgery. It is definitely um, on this side is, is the left is higher risk, the, the right is lower risk. You notice that uh, nuclear industry, which if you think about it is a really scary thought, is extremely safe on the right-hand side, whereas pediatric cardiac surgery is very much on the left here. Um, <clears throat> now, how do you, how do you uh, get good results in pediatric cardiac surgery? I think one has to think of it as at the system level, uh, not at the individual level. Obviously, individual level is important. Obviously, the skill of an individual practitioner, be it a surgeon, interventional cardiologist, echocardiographer, whatever, is, uh, uh, is the condition sine qua non for you to have good results, but uh, you have to think as, uh, as the entire team, I've listed here the important factors uh, that play a role in achieving good outcomes, and specifically neonatal cardiac surgery, highly complex, low error tolerant. So you really want to be preventative as opposed to reactive. You want to prevent errors as opposed to react to them. And you have to have all these things listed here, sophisticated organization structure, you have to have coordination, high-level cognitive technical performance. You have to have volume, ideally. And the volume, ideally, would be at the institution level, but also at the individual surgeon level. And you have to have some case complexity as well. Now, we talked a little bit about xenotransplantation. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, it's, it's an exciting uh, period. Uh, at Columbia, we're doing a lot of research in uh, xenotransplantation. We've, we've been doing this for decades, actually, but now this, this new event at the University of Maryland, the first human uh, xenotransplantation has really changed the field and suddenly people are interested and I, I do think that uh, it is going to be routine in the next five to ten years. Uh, in closing, 
you know, I could be talking a lot more about nanotechnology, AI, phytotherapy, I haven't really mentioned material sciences. You know, when you think about it, what we use, what we implant in children uh, is really not very sophisticated. Nothing grows with a child when you implant a patch or a stent in a one-year-old. By the time they are five or ten years old, we have to either redilate or change the conduit, et cetera, et cetera. Those are very, you know, things that we could, we could do better. Uh, the field uh, has always been defined uh, by basic science research and surgical audacity, and I could say uh, with a lot of interventional cardiologists sitting here, interventional audacity as well. Uh, and so the question is when and where will the next disruptive event occur? We'll be seeing what happens. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, the question will be at the end of the session. Uh, it's uh, giving me great pleasure to introduce Doctor Ayan Pobel. 